Hi there. Uh, today we have Matt uh, Singer, and he's in here. He's been working on the teletype with uh, Julie, and Matt's really kind of dove into this machine. And as you can see, we have the platen removed. That's the kind of um, the, the rotating part where the, the paper would rotate on. We also have the carriage removed. That's uh, right over here. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, we also have the tape punch removed, but that's not even going to figure in uh, today. Uh, but what's amazing about having this stuff pulled out is that we can talk about how um, characters are sent and also how they're received by the machine and how they would be typed. Um, and since we've got this all pulled apart, Matt's been oiling it um, and many other kinds of adjusting things. Bit by bit with this little guy. Yeah, we have this really cool oiling pen that Warren told us to get. I don't know if we can see this on here, but when Matt pushes in the button on the end, a little pin comes out and a single drop of oil will come down. Um, so it's like the perfect little tool for, for getting into all the nooks and crannies on this machine. There is no shortage of nooks and crannies on this machine. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so let's talk about sending a character, um, because I thought this was uh, pretty mind-blowing. Um, so uh, take it away. So, um, sending a character obviously would start with the keyboard. Um, you're obviously, you want to type something, start with the keyboard. So, um, let's start with, uh, let's just do the letter A. Sure. Uh, so, when I press the letter A on the end here, yep. this series of contacts would be moved by uh, the series of linkages here to set out the letter A on these switches. So, when I press that, there's the letter A. So, that's going to set up the series of switches, which is a parallel set of data. It's a series of ones and zeros in parallel. That is carried through this wire. It's plugged into our color control unit, which we do not have in here. Um, and then it makes its way to the distributor. Now, so you can see these wires coming in uh, to the distributor to each one of these pieces. Or actually, these would be going out, I suppose, but yeah. but each one of these uh, little segments has a wire going yeah, to yeah. it. Yeah, the little segments here are the uh, from the keyboard, and then this one on the middle is, is uh, the destination. So uh, oh, each cool. of these segments corresponds to one of these switches here. So now that I've pressed a key, this distributor unlocks is free to spin, and each of those clicks, as you're hearing, is the brush moving to another segment on the distributor. So it's connecting, in turn, each of the switches on the keyboard, which serializes the data out onto the line. And now that it's done, it locks back into place. Yep. Hit another key, and the distributor will start spinning again. Now I don't know if I can see this, but there's a tiny little catch right down here. So yes, right, right down in here next to my fingernail. Yeah, so right when across. it finishes and you see the rotator, it'll pop down and the brush will stop spinning. And I can press a key. Now it's up here. Then spin. And there it goes. Yep. And click. Awesome. Um, so another interesting thing about this machine is um, a couple, you know, other uh, things that we take for granted on, on a, a keyboard, right, is things like um, the shift key. Yep, these guys here. So, um, Matt, you were saying uh, shift doesn't work with the characters, like the alphabetic. Yeah, it's worth noting that this machine can't handle lowercase letters. Even though it's part of ASCII, it's not actually on the type head for this machine. So if, if we look at the type head, it's a little difficult to, to show this. I'm, I'm here. here, can you hold that? Yeah. Thank you. There's the drum. So on the drum, if we look at this, um, let's see here. Let's see if I can get it to rock up there. There we go. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so pretty much just capital letters, some punctuation. Numbers. Um, numbers. No lowercase letters. You can take my word for it if you, if you didn't quite see it. Got it? All right. Yep. Yeah. So, um, this thing doesn't really have a need for, uh, for being able to do lowercase. Um, but... And even when you try to press a letter, it will force the shift key back up. Huh. 
However, you have shift is useful for all of these characters on top. So if I want to do an exclamation point, just like how you would do it today. Yep. Um, oh, and you're, you can reset it down here. Yeah, I'm without... manually resetting it without um, spinning it so that I can sure. continue to press keys. Because it's worth noting that um, if I press a key and then start the, the process of distributing it, it doesn't want... The design is set up so that you can't press another key and change the code before it's done sending it. Right. So right now, these, uh, that's the key I press, which is why yep. I can still press it. Um, but these are all locked out. Sure. So I press a key. Um, like I'm going to press a different key. I can actually feel that it's sent it when it drops. Yeah. Yeah, it moves a little bit, but then it doesn't actually, like, get to its full position until... Um, until it disengages. Right, it's a very positive feeling when it yeah. gets all the way down. But, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's just a great little bit of tactility so that, you know, people could actually, the typists could actually type at the, you know, the maximum rate of the machine just by feeling. Uh, so what if I wanted to repeat a key? So um, it's also worth noting that, you know, if you press a key and you held it down, it won't send it over and over again like a modern keyboard. To send it again, you'd have to press it down again. Or, if you knew that you wanted to send a bunch of characters, like let's say you wanted to empty their entire paper bin, <laughs> you would hold down the repeat key and then press another key, in this case the line feed. And then so long as I hold this, it's going to keep the bar there un or from latching again. Uh -huh which allows the distributor to keep sending out that code over and over and over again until it let go. Huh. That's cool. And uh, finally, the control key. Yeah, so control is interesting too. Um, so control will work with um, pretty much any of the letter characters. I don't think it works with the numbers. Yep, so it does not work with the numbers. <laughs> but you can, you held on the control key to do control characters, and this is back in the day when control characters actually had a meaning, like control G for bell, and that would set up the control or the characters, or that would set up the switches on the side here to send the bit pattern for the bell character, which would ring the bell. And uh, we have on the a, other end, of course. Yeah, on the other end. So we have a handy uh, uh, sheet here. ASCII sheet. It's got a little glare here in the video, but um, we notice that G is basically in the same. G is uh, hex code or hex character, uh, or it's the hex code forty-seven. And if you go octal one hundred seven, if you drop the four from the hex, yep, you have bell. Yeah, you get so octal one hundred seven is forty-seven and. Octal 007 is bell. So just like you said, if you drop the 4 bit, uh, then you've got bell. So that makes sense. Like, control, this surprised me. I hadn't really thought about this before, but control essentially takes away a bit from the character, and that makes it the control character. Right. It, moves, it shifts it into the non-printable section. And to this day, those control characters are still used for things. It's just a lot of them are unused. Yeah. Which date back to machines like this which is amazing to me. Um, so, okay, so going over to this side, let's talk a little bit about um, receiving characters. So, yeah, so the receiving side of the machine is completely separate. Um, so it's worth noting that... I keep saying that phrase. It's worth noting. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so um, the keyboard is only linked to the, type, or the, uh, um, the typing unit here by just a couple of linkages that go back to the sender back here. The rest of this machine, almost all of it, is for typing, for receiving characters. So, um, because I sent a bell earlier, it's actually, and it's one of the few things that's actually connected here. Uh, right. <laughs> let's actually since, set up a bell character. Yeah, so since we have the platen removed and the carriage removed, we can't really show uh, typing a, a regular character, but the bell you know, literally the bell. Yeah, the, the carriage uh, would move back and forth here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the bell is actually attached and we can we can receive that. Yep. So take it away. So for receiving a... So the, the path of data through this machine 
Um, uh, the device that's here is called the rangefinder, and what it does is it synchronizes this machine with the remote one. So right here, mm -hmm. when this arm comes up, that's yep. the beginning of the receiving of a of a of a serial string. Yep. So this arm lifts up, and that uh, if a, if an alignment needed to be done, this arm would stick down and it would help align things. But that's not the case here. So next up, I'm going to manipulate this arm here, and you're probably not going to be able to see it move too much, but yeah. it goes back and forth a tiny, tiny bit. So this magnet is controlled by the signal from the line. So the ons and offs turn this magnet on and off okay. in time to the uh, the synchronized rate. So when I, I can pull it over here, I might try and do it up here. Okay. Um, can you see down through yep. there too? Yeah, I can. Okay, so I'm going to do this by sound. And so listen for the clicks. I'm going to pull the arm forward, and as we go through, that's one. Okay, I should have hit three. I haven't heard the clicks too well, but I'm going to let go. All right, so if I did this correctly, the first three are bars right here, these copper colored bars, yep. should lift. Because they are our bits. Yep. Well, they transfer the data from that's been serialized in here to set up. Uh, they're kind of shaped like combs. And then these set up the code bars. So, in just a moment here. Okay, I did not do too well. One for three, huh? That's okay. Well, let's reset let's try this. Try again, yep. And I'll try one more time. This time I'm going to actually reach over here. So sure. It's a bit easier for yep. me to feel what's going on. Yep. So, I put my finger on here just as it comes uh, past that point. I don't want to set yep. up the rangefinder. All right. So, okay, that first click is the beginning of where it's going to start setting things up. Okay. So, that's bit one, bit two, and bit three. Mm -hmm. So now I let go. Yep. And now it's checked bit four, five, six, seven, eight. So now, in a moment, these should lift up. There we go. Yep. Now, these being free allows the allows these code bars to get pulled into this position. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna stop you just for a second so you can see. Can you point to the three code bars that are moved? Yeah, these three right here, and I can even move them back a little bit. Yep, yeah, perfect. That's perfect. So they popped up after the copper colored bars popped into position. Yep. So for special characters like these, which don't print, um, the path of the data comes along these bars, which normally the lifting and lowering of these bars help set up characters to print to the paper. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we're going to be following these bars along here. So, on the underside of these bars is a set of um, kind of teeth and gaps, and when the bars are set up in this situation, mm -hmm. it allows this arm that I have my finger on right mm -hmm. here, and we'll give it a little wiggle, it allows this arm to slide up higher than it would normally. So, right now, it should be in the period, whip, there it goes. So these arms are sliding up just ever so slightly. You might have just heard a click. Mm -hmm. That click, yep, it is on. So and that, when you did that, actually, I could see the hammer on the bell wiggle. So if you look perfect, yeah. under the bell, there's a little brass hammer, and, and when he wiggles that bar, we can see that hammer wiggle. Now, you might have noticed before when I wiggled it, it wasn't moving the hammer. And that's because by letting this rise up higher, it is now latched onto the pawl that is connected to the hammer. Mm-hmm. So now, there's a, the, all the arms get pushed down by uh, basically this bar right here. So it goes through a cycle. And it's come back up to engage it, and now it's going to go down. So as it comes down, the spring will start to stretch. There it goes. Yep. And then we're going to have another thing coming up here. I just want to make sure that I don't go past. All right, there we go. So... Now, it's about as far down as it's going to go. In order for it to strike the bell, it obviously has to come off of this arm. Yep. Now, to do that, 
back up in here, there is a cam that my finger's on right now. So it's right there yep. on this side. And there's a cam follower here, a little roller. And that follower is going to get pushed up. Yep. And then that has an L-shaped linkage that goes to a bar that you may or may not be able to see. Yeah, and my finger's sure. on it yeah. right now, but it's it's yeah. down there, and it goes against the backside of all of these poles. Sure. That can hook underneath the option bars. It's called the it's called the stripper bar. Okay. Or the stripper bail. That's it. Okay. So it comes through and releases <laughs> the pole from the bar. Cool. So, um, and notably, these bars have been reset. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we're back to uh, a whole bunch of zeros. Hmm. That is so cool. And it's all done pretty much entirely mechanically. The only electrical part in this section that actually is involved with setting things up is the magnet. Wow. There's some other stuff that is for feedback on this end. We've got some switches that can be set by those option levers. Yeah. And whatnot, um, but it's entirely electromechanical, and the design of this will have not changed. I mean, they probably for the first iteration of this design probably showed up in like the forties. Yeah. Um, this is a the design of this I think is sixties vintage, and then I'm not sure when this machine itself was made. There's some references to to it being a a later revision. Stuff like the cover over there has the um, doesn't whatever it's one piece instead of two. Yeah. But yeah, it's been a blast learning about this machine uh, through trial and thankfully not too much error. <laughs> so yeah. A little bit here and there. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, we still got some problems to work on it uh, before we get it put back together. Um, hopefully have it running on under its own power soon and give a demonstration yeah. of it, uh, you know, doing a little hello world for us. That would be amazing. And one last thing I forgot to ask. So we were driving the, the motor by hand here, yeah, so um, but in practice, uh, how fast would this thing be operating? So uh, it has a couple of speed ratings, but it can do up to about 10 characters per second. <whistles> so um, as slow as I was going there, you can imagine it going maybe you know 100 times faster than right. I was going. <laughs> but uh, it, it'll, it'll really fly and make a racket when it's going. Yeah. But that's part of why uh, we wanted to shoot this video today, because we've got the call control unit out so you could see that brush spinning, and we've got everything kind of taken apart so we can manually turn the motor. Um, in, in, yeah, so in, in practice, we, uh, we wouldn't really be able to see that stuff happening. So Which, if we have any teletype nerds watching this, um, we have very little information on this call control unit. Is from a third-party vendor, um, but you know, yeah, it's always fun. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Matt, and uh, thanks for watching, and stay tuned.